Hi folks, thanks for coming out. My name is Mauve, my pronouns are they, it, and today I'm going to be talking about peer-to-peer -peer databases and how you can build them on top of IPLD Prolly trees. Now, before we get into peer-to-peer -peer databases, let's talk about how regular databases work and how they can serve data so fast. At the core, most database engines consist of a query layer that sits on top of collections of data and indexes over that data, which speed up searches. So let's talk about the indexing bit. What does it mean to search through data without an index? To start, if you want to search for data related to a given query, you'd need to search through all of your data in order to know if you satisfied that query. What's more, if you want to perform a sort on your data at the same time, you'll need to do that in tandem with filtering and buffer the order of the results either to disk or in memory as you go. This is fine for small data sets if your CPU and disk are fast enough, but as your data grows, so would the latencies for searches. Database indexes are separate collections that sit alongside your main data, but instead of having the full data that's sorted by VID, it's just one or two properties that are sorted by value. What's convenient is that you can have all the data sorted ahead of time and can quickly seek to what you need and skip anything you don't when you perform a query. This is also very useful for streaming results in. Instead of waiting for a full query to finish, you can start processing data as your uh, application gets it and as soon as it's available. So databases typically use B plus trees for storing indexes. You can think of them as key value stores where the keys are bytes and are sorted from lowest to highest. B plus trees also have the property of being efficient for seeking into a sorted list and to then sequentially read ranges of key value pairs from that. Here's a rough picture of what the structure of a B tree looks like. Data is stored and uh, stored sequentially in leaf nodes. And there's intermediate nodes that, that are created that point to the leaf nodes along with the starting key within that leaf. You can then replace individual leaves or intermediate nodes up until the root without needing to update the rest of the tree. You can also quickly search through the tree to find the leaf node that contains the start of whatever range you're seeking. The way it works is you start at the root, you find the closest leaf to the key you're searching for, then you traverse down and repeat until you add, uh, reach an actual leaf. And from there, you can start doing a sequential read and follow the pointers to the next uh, leaf with the rest of the range you're seeking. So one of the downsides of vTrees is that the order that you insert or delete keys can change the shape of the leaf nodes and how everything links together. For example, if you insert into a tree that had a key deleted before, or if you insert in a key that got deleted after, you can have different boundaries between leaf nodes. This makes them less suitable for distributed systems where peers are authoring and replicating changes in different orders. An alternative is to make use of another data structure, proly trees. They're like B plus trees in that you have uh, ordered key value pairs within leaves stitched by intermediate nodes. However, instead of using pointers in memory and chunking keys as they're written, each leaf and each intermediate node is content addressed, in this case using IPLD. As well, when keys are being inserted into the structure, boundaries between leaf nodes are calculated based on the content address of keys rather than on insertion order. This means that regardless of the order that keys are inserted, each peer would come to the exact same structure for their tree at the byte level. Here's what it looks like at the schema level. The root of a proly tree has information about how the tree was chunked so that that tree can be easily updated or merged with other trees without having to hard code those chunking settings for the entire application. Uh, each tree node then has a list of keys and a list of values that go with those keys. It also has an is leaf boolean that lets the application know whether this is a leaf node which contains actual values or if the values are links to further tree nodes. 
So here's a gist of how you construct a Prolly tree or how you can go about updating a portion of it. What's useful is that it's a bottom-up approach and you can build the tree as you ingest data. So first you start by uh, beginning to add keys to a leaf node. So as you're doing this, you're going to be checking for chunk boundaries for each uh, key value pair. And once you've discovered a boundary, you create a parent node if one doesn't exist and a sibling node. You add all remaining keys to the sibling and you add the current node and the sibling node to the parent. Then you repeat this process for the sibling. And after you've processed all the keys, you go to the parent nodes and uh, process them and then keep going up until you have a new root node for all of your data. So with this, you'll have a balanced tree where you'll have chunk indexes where you expect them, uh, sorry, chunk boundaries where you expect them, and you'll have sequential keys to read in your application. So the boundaries between leaves can be calculated based on a chunking threshold. This is an integer that's used to determine the probability that a new chunk should be started. You take the hash of the given key value pair, and if it's less than the threshold, then you know you need to put all subsequent keys into a new chunk. This is reminiscent of the hash cache algorithm used in things like Bitcoin. The lower your threshold value is, the less likely a boundary will occur, and the larger your tree nodes will get. So from here, you can start worrying about the details of trees and focus more on the key space. Here's an example of how you can segregate the key space for a collection of posts. You can have a top level prefix for everything related to posts. Then you can have a longer prefix for all the individual documents in your database that are posts. And finally, you can have separate prefixes for each index over those posts. With this, you can do sequential reads on documents and different indexes and avoid overlap between different collections within a single data set. For example, here's what an index with a few posts could look like. Uh, we take the created at and tags property out of each post, and we make a new index key, which points to the post's ID. Notice how everything is sorted by the timestamp. So you can seek to a start time and filter out irrelevant tags without fetching the full post. In this example, we have three posts, but what if you have a million and only want the most recent 50? Well, you can seek to today, get the first 50 posts that match your query, and ignore the rest of the DAG entirely, skipping all of that extra loading. That's because with Prolly trees, the network is your database. As you query the key space, you'll be loading parts of the DAG using either block exchange or graph sync or whatever other uh, replication protocol you want. And instead of replicating everything and then making it usable, you can start loading data uh, and just the data that needs to be on the page now. You can also load more data in the background to speed up subsequent searches and to be available while offline. When merging data sets, you can skip any equivalent branches and stitch in new branches without having to fully traverse the values. Combined, this lets application authors focus more on their data and making efficient queries, not worry as much about initial load times. There's some trade-offs to consider. However, um, if you choose to have larger chunks on average, you'll end up having them updated more often as keys are added and changed. At the same time, if you have smaller chunks, your tree will be deeper and you'll potentially need to do more round trips to load it. On the indexing side, the more indexes you have, the more duplicate data you have. But these indexes are important for making your queries efficient. Sometimes it could be the difference between scanning across all your data and having poor UX while you wait for that to happen, or having a bunch of duplicate data and using up extra storage on your device. Generally speaking, you'd be making indexes for data locally if it's not on the network, so it's usually worth it. Lastly, the question of how to merge data from multiple sources is nuanced, and there's a lot of ways to do that depends on your application. You might be using CRDTs, you might have a last right win strategy, you might have um, some other thing I'm not going to bring up now. And 
even though we have these useful structures for indexing, there's still a lot to be done at the application layer to make these databases useful. So hopefully that's given you some more insight into how this stuff works, and maybe it sparks some ideas on how you can build your own databases too. If you're interested, we've got a spec for how this can be implemented using IPLD, and we've got a matrix channel where we've been chatting about peer-to-peer -peer databases in general. So come check out our source and join us in building efficient and usable peer-to-peer -peer apps. Thank you so much. With the trolley trees, every time you are ingesting new data, you are mutating the state and potentially creating a lot of new objects. Have you thought about when it makes sense to do that directly versus when it makes sense to have some kind of novelty cache that builds up a bunch of novelty and then when you reach some size, then do the merge of that novelty into the deeper trees and indexing and all of that work that is going to happen every time you have to merge in novelty. Yeah, so generally what you want to do if you are going to be ingesting a lot of data is do batch operations. Um, so uh, if you look at the Go implementation that's linked to in the spec that you can see on the screen, um, we actually use batching where for like before committing anything to disk and doing any sort of balancing or content addressing, we just start kind of like sorting all of the keys that will be inserted before we build the tree. And then we modify whatever nodes need to be modified. And after everything is ready, then we commit to actually hashing everything, checking the uh, chunk boundaries and rebalancing and all of that. So generally, if you're dealing with a bunch of data, or even if you're inserting a single object, which will touch multiple indexes, you're going to want to batch it before doing it all on the fly. Because yeah, as you mentioned, like if you do everything all at once, it's going to be like a major overhead. Um, one other thing, I mentioned kind of IPLD and how you can do this high level algorithm of how it works, but you can actually do a lot more optimization because you don't have to have objects. If your keys and your values are fixed width in terms of how many bytes there are, you can have a continuous block of memory and just have some other data structure being like, oh, hey, here's the boundaries between the chunks. And we're just going to calculate them on the fly without any extra allocation. So. All that to say, there's a whole bunch of optimization you can do on reads with batching and memory allocation that can really like be used mostly when you're um, writing custom code for the specific data you're uploading. Um, and by default, we have batching already, but the the fixed um, like memory address stuff is uh, kind of like a to do after we do more uh, performance optimization for larger scale data sets. Um, was that kind of the, the gist of what you were getting at? Thanks. Yeah, I've got a question. Um, or I guess, you know, currently in Fireproof, I'm trying to decide should I make my leaf nodes like all BC IDs instead of embedded JSON? I um, mean, it sounds like what you just mentioned about the um, fixed width, you know, uh, optimizations is. Uh, you know, may lean me toward CIDs. The thing that leans me toward JSON is that most of my um, JSON documents are smaller than a CID, you know? So um, it's sort of a not sure kind of situation. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm not quite sure what your question is, but I want to say thanks for pointing out that like there's more to the trade-off than I had realized. Yeah, I think in general, even if you're looking at like JSON-ish documents, it might be worth it to see if you can use Seabor or something instead, because then you could potentially still get that fixed uh, byte width um, for your data without having to go the CID route. For example, if you're dealing with numbers, especially, it's just so much easier to encode them as like unsigned bytes or sorry, unsigned like U32s or whatever, instead of going the JSON route where now you also lose the um, lexi um, lexicographic sort. To get that optimization you're talking about, you'd want to have a table model maybe then so you know what your columns are? 
Maybe. Um, it, it depends. Personally, uh, before I did this IPLD work, I made a database using similar indexing principles using uh, Hypercore Protocol's Hyper-B library, which is a B-plus tree that's peer-to-peer. -peer. And in there, I actually used BSON from the um, MongoDB ecosystem. And so that's also schemaless. And you just kind of have to be careful where you're like, yeah, make sure you use this schema. Um, maybe uh, do it at the application le level. But since the data is encoded into binary bytes, uh, you kind of get that whole like fixed width stuff for free. And especially with BSON, I find that uh, having dates be a first class citizen is super useful. Interesting. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's almost, if you're giving knobs to application developers, you can say, hey, one of the benefits you get from working with a schema is a little bit of performance enhancement. Yeah, that's also why longer term, I was really hoping we could do like a more holistic approach with IPLD, where we could take the IPLD schema for poly trees themselves, and then we can layer it with the specification of here's how you have indexed collections of IPLD documents, where here's the schema we're applying to the documents, and then here's the indexes that we're applying over that schema, and then just have kind of like a spec that we can reuse between uh, database implementations. Because like on, on one hand, like IPLD is nice for having standardization on how you encode and decode data and what the fields look like, but the actual like guts of a de database, I think, aren't even just the data, but are more like how you find the data, how you authenticate it, and stuff like that. So, I was really hoping we can make a spec at some point, but so far it's like very up in the air. Um, but yeah, schemas or tables, <laughs> right? Um, the decode block function gets a lot of churn in my implementation. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Like ideally, if we were all using IPLD, then that could do like a huge uh, amount of the work for us, where it's like, you might be using Seabor, you might be using um, JSON, whatever else. And if you're using IPLD and CIDs, that can just be kind of done automatically. As well with probably trees, since they're using CIDs to link to stuff, you can have kind of an easy way of building a car file of an entire database and just kind of dumping it and sending it wherever, um, like on Filecoin. Right. Um, yeah, I've, I've got um, plans to put car files into the static, you know, um, Gatsby site build. Um, well, so, right, so that the, the database is ready when you load the page. Maybe you have deeper thoughts on, um, like, I know that just block by block network sync can be excruciatingly slow. Um, and so graph sync is a step up from that, um, having a closed world where you sip, ship all the car files is a different way to do it, but then you have to send the whole database. You don't get that you know, kind of partial data paging that you were talking about. Um, what should we be thinking about if we, if we want to, you know, if that's the cake we want to eat, like, <laughs> what do we got to do? Yeah, I think one of the things is that it depends on your load a lot. So if you have, for example, like polytree nodes, which are very fat, then that means you can reduce the number of network requests you do. And one strategy that I don't have numbers for this yet, but I think is going to be viable is when you do the initial load of the database, we fetch maybe the first few layers of the Merkle tree via graph sync. And then from there, we can do a uh, block exchange to download the specific uh, leaves we think we need, or maybe do subsequent graph sync requests or yeah, graph sync requests to get multiple nodes from there. Because like, you don't really need to download that much. Like compared to say, um, like an IPFS UnixFS DAG, there's a whole bunch of traversal that's done um, to fetch chunks, and especially if you're fetching a directory, there's like so many blocks you want to download. Compared to the poly trees, if they're fat enough, you might just be getting like maybe one or two levels at the top before you hit leaves. And just like due to the uh, OLOG 
10 ish uh like uh complexity of the data set you can have really huge amounts of data without that much uh block exchange because like again the big difference here from other uh peer-to-peer -peer database approaches is we're sparse and indexed so like whereas orbit db it's an append only log where you're going to be processing a whole bunch of data before it's usable or like a lot of other things you have to do like a bunch of work up front that kind of like makes the network a lot more noisy whereas here it's like we do maybe two requests and we're at data and we're already iterating through it um yeah, I, I think as well, there is probably going to be room for um, custom replication protocols on top of it. For example, the Hyper-B uh, library I mentioned earlier in the HyperCore ecosystem, their data model is also an append-only log. And so they send bit fields to get like chunks of the log. But what they do is they actually have a little side channel where they talk about like, hey, I want to do a query for this range in the B tree. And then over that side, ch side channel, the peer can tell them, oh, well, if you want that, here's kind of like the ranges. And then instead of requesting all the blocks individually, they can now send a bit field um, without actually having to traverse the B tree. So we might have optimizations like that where we're like, oh, we want to just get this range from you, peer either send me the Merkle proof right away or tell me what blocks I should request for me to get that. So there's a bunch of things there, but um, I think it's really exciting. And I think there's a lot of potential for improving UX because right now peer-to-peer -peer apps, their UX is okay, but especially if you get a lot of data, it just drops so drastically where you're sitting there just waiting for a spinner or waiting for, like after you wait for the initial connection, waiting for the initial sync, it's just not great. Whereas um, when we have indexing at our core, we, we have the potential for just like really speedy databases and like really snappy apps. Um, yeah, so I think that's like my deep thoughts. <laughs> Hey, yeah, so I, I think I heard about uh, the plans to also have a Rust implementation. So I'm from the Arrow team, and I would like to love to uh, figure out if I can make uh, probability trees work with Arrow, with the new Arrow. But it would be quite helpful to have a Rust implementation so I can just play around with it. Uh, so what's the status on that? Yeah, so there is a little bit of a pause. Um, as you all know, um, Protocol Labs had like a little bit of like a restructuring. Um, towards the beginning of the year. And so a bunch of the dev grants that were going out were kind of like put on hold while that was being figured out. But actually, I think last week, the Rust Im implementation has uh, kept going. So Simon or Sianois, I don't know how to pronounce his um, handle, uh, has actually been resuming on that. And so he's progressing on that and uh, following the spec that we wrote. Um, if you're curious and like figuring out more, there is the matrix channel, uh, hashtag P2P-DBs uh, at mob.moe. And so we're chatting in there. Um, it's progressing. So far, I think there's the implement implementation of a Merkle search tree, which has very different performance trade-offs, but um, probably trees are like actively being worked on. So Definitely, we can get that in Iro um, if that's something that is exciting for y'all. I'm personally really excited by that prospect. How do you usually think about caching these things? Because there's going to be a lot more heat toward the top of the tree. And you can save a few round trips if you take just a small amount of storage to cache the top of the tree. Yeah. Absolutely. So again, I think we could learn from the HyperCore ecosystem here because they've been doing a lot of this stuff with their HyperB module. So what they have is an LRU, so like a least recently used cache, where they just have a bunch of the blocks in memory and they can preemptively uh, search a bunch of stuff. So I'm imagining we might have some sort of pub sub if you have a swarm of peers um, making updates to databases. And then from that pub sub, you might either gossip like 
several nodes, depending on how big they are, or you might use that as a trigger to um, start requesting blocks and maybe caching them in memory. So I think there's a lot of room for optimizations, but um, honestly, it might depend on the numbers because my, my gut feeling, and this is, again, not qualified with uh, numbers yet, is that even before we get all the fa fancy caching, we can still get like really good uh, performance out of it. Um, but yeah, definitely um, in memory LRU with preemptively fetching, maybe the first couple layers is going to uh, do a lot without having to cost too much. Thank you. In fact, like, yeah, it, it, in fact, like maybe the first two layers you only store in memory because those are the ones that are going to um, change the most. Um, if there's no other questions, I actually have a, another thing I want to plug, which I didn't get into the slides. Yeah, so um, I'm kind of into this whole virtual augmented reality stuff. And one of the big motivators for me from PolyTrees is to, is to build uh, spatial indexes. So what's cool is indexing spatial data has been something that databases have been doing for ages and referencing to data that's in a spatial index. Uh, there's been just a lot of useful work from, uh, say, uh, Google and Uber and stuff. And one of the things I really want to do is to have a collaborative spatial index for like metaverse type use cases, where we could use something like quad keys to just have a flat map and have some sort of like very loose layer where a community can just place virtual objects on it. Um, longer term, I also think this could be a useful structure for uh, community mesh networks that use augmented reality, where you can onboard onto the mesh and start placing things in physical reality and kind of like spreading them over the physical uh, connections in your reality. So I think this could be like a useful structure for taking a lot of the stuff we have in like centralized databases, but now making it more peer-to-peer -peer and local first and kind of like more uh, available. <laughs> so that's one thing I'm excited about. If that's something others are excited about as well, um, hit me up. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, up on that. So I guess that means you'd also be able to use it as a vector index and then you could get that sweet AI money. Yeah, probably. I mean, literally anything you can put in a B tree, you could put in a poly tree. And the the other kind of like key thing here is that poly trees aren't for store just for storage and querying; they're for merging as well. So if you have a bunch of these large indexes or data sets, like AI or otherwise, you can now seamlessly kind of intertwine them, where anywhere where there's similarities, they just kind of slot together. And you can skip a bunch of extra processing um, for sections that don't have overlap in the tree. So I think there's a lot of potential for combining larger data sets and for stuff like data DAOs to deal with like more interesting big data use cases. Um, but again, learning what we can do in centralized, but now it's also decentralized. Awesome, thanks so much and, for uh, all the QA stuff. Um, and it was a super informative. I have code to go, I'm gonna go um, increase my branch factor and take advantage of those fat upper nodes, um, like <laughs> next thing. Um, so yeah, yeah uh, um, I guess a round of applause for Mo.